What is up, you guys? Welcome to a Costa Rica edition of Controversial Thoughts. I am clearly not in Texas right now. I'm sitting in an Airbnb in Santa Teresa overlooking the ocean and the waves, but I still wanted to do a Controversial Thoughts video this week. I apologize for the suboptimal audio. If you are watching on YouTube, you can tell why that is the case. There's definitely some construction going on behind me, so if that happens during this mini podcast, I apologize. But Important question that I think a lot of people ask, should you include a calcium source on your carnivore or animal-based diet? This is something many of us has gone round and round about over and over, and I think it's important to address, and I think it's particularly timely now as we just released Bone Matrix at Heart and Soil. So <clears throat> Bone Matrix is microcrystalline hydroxyapatite. I'm going to show some studies specifically with that. That is calcium complex to phosphorus in bone. It's actually a bone meal, quote unquote, but it's a very high quality bone meal. It's not just any bone meal. It's bone meal from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle in New Zealand, raised on regenerative farms, and it's in the actual bone matrix, which is why we call it bone matrix, that you're getting this microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, you're getting collagen, you're getting bovine active in A, you're getting other minerals that occur in bones like boron, manganese, strontium, all of which are important for bone health. But let's address the question here. Should you include calcium on your carnivore animal-based diet? Why, should, why would you not include calcium on your carnivore or animal-based diet? Well, Here's the thing. I just got back from Africa and people ask me, do the Hadza eat bones? They definitely break the bones and suck the marrow. And when you do that, you're getting bone flakes with that. If any culture is going to be eating small fish like sardines or other things like this, you're going to be getting some calcium in those bones. Some cultures in Africa, like the Maasai, have dairy. They're getting calcium in their diet from that. But for a lot of us on animal-based diets, like myself, dairy doesn't really play well with our immunology with our immune system and it causes my eczema to flare no matter what I do, whether it's, whether it's raw dairy, whatever. So that's, um, that's just me. I can't do dairy. If you can do dairy, check out colostrum, which is amazing. That's why we make immunomilk. Um, but a lot of people cannot do dairy. And so if you can't do dairy in your diet, should, should you have a calcium source? I think the answer is yes. And I'm going to tell you why. In general, we have the majority of our calcium stored in our bones. And so we're gonna get a very small amount in meat. I think it's about 60 milligrams per pound of calcium, not a whole lot. The recommended daily allowance, which again is never perfect, um, and it's probably based on diets that are standard American and very poor quality is around 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. So if you're only eating meat and organs and not doing any bones or anything else for a calcium source, you might be getting 100 milligrams of calcium a day. There's a real divide there between the amount of calcium that you're getting in meat and organs and the amount found in, or the amount at least recommended by the FDA. Now, it is true that on higher protein diets, calcium absorption goes up in the intestines, but so does calcium excretion. So the flux seems about the same. Now, every day in our urine and our poop and our sweat, we lose some calcium. We have a huge repository of calcium in our bones, but do we actually want to be tapping into that? How do you know if you're tapping into the uh, calcium repository in your bones. You could check your parathyroid hormone, which is from a small gland located within the thyroid gland. You want your parathyroid hormone to be low, to be the lower end of normal. In fact, the lower quarter of the reference range of normal is where I like to see PTH, parathyroid hormone. You could also check C or N talopeptide to see if there's bone turnover happening. I'll get into osteoporosis a little bit later in this mini podcast, but I think for the majority of people, if you have osteoporosis, you are going to benefit from a bone-based calcium and you are probably gonna to need to get more protein in your diet. In fact, there's good evidence that high protein diets actually improve bone quality, bone resiliency, and decrease fracture rates rather than increasing them as some may incorrectly suggest. So back to the original question, should you include calcium on your, on your carnivore animal-based diet if you're not doing dairy? The answer for me is yes, because you are losing some every day in your urine, your poop, and your sweat. Now. Do you have to get it every day? No, you don't necessarily have to get it every day. Do the hods get it every day? Probably not, but they definitely get some calcium from small animals, galagos, bush babies, birds. They're gonna eat the ends of the bones. They're breaking the bones. They're getting bone shards in there, okay? So hunter-gatherers do eat calcium from bones 
carnivorous animals, quote unquote, like lions definitely eat bones. And it's known within zoology and zoos that the calcium to phosphorus ratio is important for humans. So why in the world would anybody suggest that we wouldn't want to get calcium in our carnivore or animal-based diet? Well, some people use the suggestion or use the evidence that their calcium level in their blood is normal. So why would I need calcium? I've been doing a carnivore or animal-based diet with no calcium source for a year and the calcium level in my blood is normal. I think this is a faulty uh, set of reasoning because that calcium level in your blood, your serum calcium is tightly regulated. And if your serum calcium starts to drop at all, it's necessary for cardiac function, neuronal function, muscle function, everything is calcium based. That is tightly regulated. Your body's going to increase your PTH and it's going to pull it out of bones. Specialized cells in the bones, osteoclasts are going to resorb the bone and you're going to get calcium from the bone. So you have this ability to to adjust your calcium levels in your bone, but you don't constantly wanna be tapping into your bone to keep your serum levels of calcium normal, which is why I think we all need a calcium source in our diet, even those of us that don't wanna do dairy. If you like dairy, if dairy doesn't trigger your immune system, that's great. I think it's fantastic for people. That's why we make a colostrum supplement, ATV going by in the background. Um, but if you don't do well with dairy, I think microcrystal hydroxyapatite bone matrix is gonna absolutely be the best thing for your calcium needs. So what are other suggestions or what are other reasons people don't want to include calcium in their diet? There is a series of perspective. Again, this is observational epidemiology and a couple of interventional trials with calcium supplementation suggesting that it could increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, we have to remember observational evidence, not so great, a lot of flaws to epidemiology, but there are some randomized controlled trials that suggest this. Not all of them though, and I'm gonna show you randomized controlled trials that don't show evidence of increased cardiovascular disease in calcium supplementation, specifically in elderly women um, in that case. But the majority of the population, are they eating an animal-based no tail diet? No, they're not. Are they deficient in vitamin K2? Yes, I believe they are. Calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K2, vitamin A, vitamin E, all these fat-soluble vitamins interact with the minerals in our bodies very tightly. If you are deficient in vitamin K2, is it plausible, is it possible that your body might not handle excess calcium or calcium supplementation well? Yes, that's possible. So one hypothesis is when we supplement the general population with a calcium carbonate, which is chalk, not microcrystalline hydroxyapatite from bones, supplement, they're not getting any K2 because they're eating just chalk. They're eating the shitty type of calcium basically rocks or actual real chalk that you would use to run on a chalkboard. And nobody is thinking about their K2 levels. So my suspicion, my hypothesis is in the setting of vitamin K2 deficiency, calcium supplementation in the form of calcium carbonate might increase cardiovascular risk. How do we avoid that? You can eat calcium the way your ancestors have always eaten calcium from small, moderate amounts of bones, which have all the other nutrients in them that go along with calcium. And if you're eating the bones, you're probably eating the liver or something else with vitamin K2 because you're eating animal-based. So to me, this makes a lot of sense. But I want to show you guys, ATV coming back here, that there are some studies that show that there is no increase in cardiovascular disease with calcium supplementation. And the majority of these are done in elderly women because that's where a lot of calcium supplementation happens for osteoporosis. So daily vitamin D or calcium supplementation did not affect mortality, vascular disease, cancer mortality, or cancer incidence in this trial, which is titled long-term follow-up for mortality and cancer in randomized, in a randomized placebo-controlled trial of D3 and or calcium. This is the record trial. And again, I'm only going to show you guys interventional trials on this controversial thoughts. I don't think it's even worth looking at the epidemiology because it's so confusing. Another title, pretty similar, calcium supplementation and the risks of atherosclerotic vascular disease in older women results of a five-year RCT and a 4.5-year follow-up. And as you can see here, this trial provides compelling evidence that calcium supplementation of 1,200 milligrams does not significantly increase the risk of atherosclerotic vascular disease in elderly women. So not every trial with calcium shows increased rates of atherosclerotic vascular disease. And I believe the context again here, what is the vitamin K2 status of the individual? If you are vitamin K2 replete, if you have enough vitamin K2, I think you're gonna be fine getting calcium, especially the way our ancestors would have gotten it in the form of bone meal, specifically microcrystalline hydroxyapatite like we make at Bone Matrix, with Bone Matrix as hardened soil. So moving on, 
calcium supplementation has also been found to have some benefits in terms of fractures in women, especially in postmenopausal women. So this is an interesting supplement for me. I have a postmenopausal mother who's now 70 years old and I sent her some of our bone matrix supplement. She said, should I buy it? I said, mom, I'm going to send it to you. But there's a number of studies that show specifically mycocrystalline hydroxyapatite can benefit those with osteoporosis, which are usually postmenopausal women. We can look at a couple of those. So for the first one, acute and three month effects of microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, calcium citrate, calcium carbonate on serum calcium and markers of bone turnover, randomized controlled trial in postmenopausal women. You guys can look at that one if you're interested. Um, basically it shows that calcium preparations in general produce repeated sustained increases in serum calcium concentrations after ingestion of each dose. Calcium supplements with smaller effects on calcium serum concentrations may have equivalent efficacy in suppressing bone turnover. Specifically, microcrystalline hydroxyapatite has a lower effect on serum calcium, meaning it doesn't elevate calcium levels in the blood as much, probably because it's packaged with all the things our body expects as opposed to a calcium citrate or a calcium oxalate. Well, nobody supplemented calcium, calcium oxalate, but calcium carbonate and calcium citrate are generally the two supplements people are using. You would not want to supplement with calcium oxalate. We'll talk about kidney stones in a moment. So one more study, a couple more studies here looking at postmenopausal women. Use of osine hydroxyapatite, that's essentially microcrystalline hydroxyapatite complex in the prevention of bone loss, a review. This is a review paper. The microcrystalline hydroxyapatite complex is significantly more effective in preventing bone loss than calcium carbonate. Why would you take chalk? Why would you eat blackboard chalk? It's horrible shit. If you're going to use calcium in your diet, which I think we all benefit from some, microcrystalline hydroxyapatite is clearly the way to go. Here's a review showing it's better for preventing bone loss. And the fact that it prevents bone loss in these women is encouraging, especially for women like my mother or others. All of us need to prevent bone loss in general. One more, microcrystalline hydroxyapatite compound in prevention of bone loss in corticosteroid treated patients with chronic active hepatitis. So this is a little bit different situation in which these patients are receiving steroids due to a medical comorbidity. We know that a corticosteroid is going to induce osteoporosis and microcrystalline hydroxyapatite did improve the loss of bone in these patients. So we all need strong bones. Whether you're a young athlete who wants to have proper function, whether you're a postmenopausal woman, woman, and getting it from microcrystalline hydroxyapatite makes a lot of sense. There are so many other things in there. I'm not really going to talk about strontium or manganese or boron in this video. I can in the future, but they're all minerals found in bone that have other roles in the human body. It just makes so much sense to eat nose to tail, to eat it from the sources we would have gotten it from evolutionarily. And that's why we're so about eating nose to tail at heart and soil. It's going to get you liver, heart, et cetera going to get vitamin K2, which makes everything work together. It all is very simple when we just eat the way that humans have eaten for the majority of our evolution. Imagine that. It just all works. It all makes sense. More here with um, calcium supplementation, the risk of fractures. This study did not use microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, but it even showed improvements in hip bone density. Um, it did not significantly reduce hip fracture, but the microcrystalline hydroxyapatite uh, ones look like they did. And this actually increased the risk of kidney stones. So here we have an interesting question. Is calcium supplementation going to increase your risk of kidney stones? Again, I don't think it is as long as you are getting enough vitamin K2. And what is the major source of kidney stones? Calcium oxalate is the major formulation, formation is the major substance of kidney stones. So there are also calcium, there are other types of calcium stones, but they're very rare. The major type of kidney stone is calcium oxalate. How much oxalate are you getting in your diet? Are you getting enough vitamin K2 to utilize it? Do you have enough vitamin D? Do you have fat soluble nutrients like vitamin A, vitamin E? Are you getting liver? Is that giving your body the nutrients it needs to use the calcium properly? Um, I think in that situation, it is very unlikely that any sort of calcium supplementation will increase your risk of oxalate problems or your risk of kidney stones from calcium oxalate. There's a series of studies I wanna show you guys specifically showing now, again, they're using the inferior form of calcium, but even that improved premenstrual syndrome. This is, again, we're looking at um, menstruating women. So we talked earlier about elderly women or wise women, quote unquote, and now we're going to talk about young women. And this is an interventional trial. Calcium supplementation is a simple and effective treatment in premenstrual syndrome. 
resulting in a major reduction in overall luteal phase symptoms. So there are a lot of women that reach out to me uh, through Heart and Soil. You can always email me, Dr. Paul, drpaulhardensoil.co with questions about which supplement's right for you, how to do an animal-based diet. A lot of people talk about premenstrual syndromes, premenstrual dys dysphoria, et cetera. I think bone matrix would be a great addition to that type of a diet and make sure you're getting calcium in your diet from some source if you are having those symptoms as a woman. One more study showing the same result in menstruating women, calcium supplementation in premenstrual syndrome, a randomized crossover trial. Calcium supplementation, simple and effective treatment for premenstrual syndrome, but further studies are needed to determine its precise role in PMS. So here again, interventional trial showed that in these women, 78 women initially screened, um, and they received 1,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate. I think that microcrystalline hydroxyapatite would have been a better choice for them, and that improved their premenstrual syndrome syndrome symptoms. So fascinating stuff. I think that getting calcium from bone, from microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, makes absolutely the most sense for humans. If you can get it from dairy, great, as long as dairy doesn't trigger you immunologically. Um, our Bone Matrix, again, is sourced from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle, raised on regenerative farms in New Zealand. And I didn't talk about it in this video, but calcium supplementation has also been found to improve heavy metal toxicity. It prevents lead accumulation in the human body. The microcrystalline hydroxyapatite we use is probably the lowest you can get in terms of heavy metals. And I've never seen any of my clients using this microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, any bump in any of their heavy metals. So don't worry about heavy metals much on this type of high quality microcrystalline hydroxyapatite. Just want to show you guys the biochemistry as a summary. The parathyroid glands are within the thyroid gland. When calcium in the blood drops, parathyroid hormone, PTH is secreted, acts in the kidney to increase calcium reabsorption, the formation of 125 hydroxy vitamin D. Usually in the blood, we're measuring only 25 hydroxy vitamin D, but 125 hydroxy vitamin D is the active form. Works in the small intestine to increase calcium absorption. And PTH also increases bone resorption because it wants to raise the blood calcium. The balancing hormone is calcitonin from the thyroid. It decreases calcium resorption, decreases absorption in the small intestine, and decreases bone resorption. It's going to lower your blood calcium. There are actually some interventions in medicine in which we use calcitonin-like compounds for osteoporosis, but you can imagine that's a very bad idea if you don't treat the root cause. And those people end up with higher bone density, but more brittle bones that break often. So how do you get strong bones? You get enough protein, one gram of protein per pound of body weight. I'm trying to tell my mom to do that. You get enough fat soluble nutrients, vitamin K2, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E. How do you do that? Get organs in your diet, make it mostly animal-based. Meat and organs as the center of your diet. Get a calcium source and get the other minerals that are critical for bone formation. Strontium, manganese, boron, they're all there. How can you do that? Include a bone-based calcium in your diet, like microcrystalline hydroxyapatite or bone matrix. That's essentially what we make in hardened soil. So in summary, I think, I believe strongly, including calcium on your carnivore animal-based diet makes sense. Just looking at your serum calcium level is not enough to say that you're not losing calcium because you are. You have to look at your NT lipeptide, your CT lipeptide, your parathyroid hormone. And I can guarantee you that all humans are losing calcium in their sweat, urine, and poop every day. You don't want to keep pulling it out of the bones. You want to give your body that calcium back in the most bioavailable form. Microcrystalline hydroxyapatite from bones is going to make sense evolutionarily as well. So, and you're going to get all kinds of other good minerals in there. Boron, which we know is important for testosterone and estrogen production. Manganese, strontium, et cetera. Collagen is in the bone matrix. And bovine activin A, which is a peptide involved in bone and cartilage repair. So just makes sense to do it that way, guys. Hopefully this is helpful. Feel free to send your questions. Stay radical. Look for the podcast on Tuesday of next week, which will be an Ask Me Anything podcast. And we'll also be recording that from Costa Rica. I'm going to go surf.